Honey, <laughs> how to greet honey? I'm just wondering. A plan and me structure of house. Oh, okay. Sculpture, music, a great community. I love it. Anybody can explain me how to how to create honey? <laughs> well, I could I could tell you. You know, you, you can't. The, the bees have to do it. Yes. Oh, just saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good to know. All right. Well, let's. And we're ready to pass the the uh, the baton over to uh, David Chikowski. Uh David has been a high high school technology educator in the Hudson Valley for fifteen years, and he's introduced and launched students into technical careers. It's a really wonderful thing. He's had the opportunity to train teachers across the country and contribute to authoring the New York State Education Department's recent computer science and digital fluency learning standards for all K-12 students. Uh, and locally as a leader in the Mid-Hudson Valley Computer Science Teachers Association. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, David Chikowski. David. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the authentic pronunciation of my last name. Correct um, us. I, I, have, I have, no, 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 that is uh, the correct pronunciation however the americanized um pronunciation i always have my students it's three emojis it's a check it's the house and the key <laughs> so you can you can either spell my last name with 10 letters or with three emojis um either one is fine all right so let me share this uh now so my I, present what's that i see now i see why you're such a good teacher because you can <laughs> making fun out of your appreciate last that. <laughs> well, let's have fun. Uh, so thank you um, for, uh, Julia, for allowing me to uh, speak today. And thank you, those of you who are able to join both on the live stream and here during Zoom. Um, before we get started, you may have noticed that the title of this presentation is actually uh, a question. Uh, and, in, and in some way, your viewing this or participating in this here implies that you've either come for an answer to that question or perhaps you have an answer that you'd be willing to share. And I hope both of those uh, will be acknowledged and, um, and addressed during my presentation. Uh, I'd also mention that the title is kind of foreshadowing a little bit of how we're gonna spend the time uh, during this, and that is with questions, uh, because why does that matter is, is a very open-ended question um, and certainly has many implications. Um, I hope to engage with you all both through these questions and hopefully thought provoking questions at times, and also to provide some answers myself to some of the questions. Uh, so whichever camp you happen to be in, uh, I'm glad to share with you what I know, and I'm excited to hear uh, your thoughts during this. Um, I, I'm hoping to elicit some opinion responses on some of the questions, so I do want to uh, request that we start with the assumption that everyone does indeed want the best for the children in our community uh, and in the state of New York. So with that as the assumption, as people share perhaps differing opinions on things, let's at least acknowledge that we all do want the best for the kids in our community. Um, and so that their suggestions may be different from yours, but the root of why they're making that suggestion, we have commonality in. Um, I'd also like to recognize that people who choose to work in education are amazing and often very sacrificial people. Um, the Hollywood stereotype is not accurate. Um, in my 15 now 16 years working in education, yes, there are a few bad apples, uh, but the frequency of the attention they get does not reflect the frequency of them in this profession. Uh, so as we talk about education, um, you may have memories of horrible teachers that you've had, but they are not the norm. Um, so I'd like to start with those assumptions as the basis as we jump in 
and introduce myself. I am, uh, as I was introduced, my name is David Chekhowski. Um, please do feel free to send along comments, critiques, corrections. Uh, hopefully by the end of our time together, you'll also be willing to send along a connection. And I don't just mean LinkedIn. I hope to connect and uh, collaborate with many of you. It's, it's an amazing group and I love um, participating in open hub activities here in the Hudson Valley, because this is so cool, the diversity of the folks who are connected in on this. So I'm hoping to, uh, to utilize that. And I hope during this presentation, you'll see why I'd like to connect with you. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, there are gonna be a lot of questions asked during this. Um, I'm an educator. I hate standing up in front of my class and just lecturing the entire time. That's not good educational practice. And so I'm not used to giving a presentation where I just stand up and talk at you. So I'm hoping that you all will, will um, spoil me with some responses. Uh, my first one being how many years of K-12 New York public education did you experience? I think the assumption is that um, that you all have spent at least 12 years of your life in educational environments. But I wanted to narrow that and actually create more of a diversity in the chat responses. And so I'm specifically saying New York K-12 education and specifically public education. So just to kind of see some of the diversity here, uh, we all have a background. We all learned through some system, uh, whether it's independent or formalized system, um, but we have a very diverse group here. And so I would love to see some of what that is and for folks to share that out. Uh, this talk is specifically about New York State's K-12 public education. Um, so I naturally wanted to narrow this criteria a little bit for that purpose. Um, and, and when I say public education, I'm often referring to the free appropriate public education, often referred to as FAPE, FAPE, uh, which the Supreme Court established as a constitutional right based on the 14th Amendment back in the 1950s and, and through case law up through today. Um, the and, and I would have liked to have more appropriately said P-12 education, however, P, which would be a preschool, New York State is moving towards a universal preschool, which would basically start public education for all students in New York one year sooner uh, than it currently is, though that hasn't quite happened yet. Uh, we will see um, how that plays out over the next many years. Um, this talk's not about that. In fact, this talk is focused more on the computer science side. And so uh, I'm specifically narrowing it to K-12 because New York State Ed has not addressed computer science for preschool yet. Um, so my own answer is that I spent 13, um, I was in K-12 um, for 13, well, K through 12 is 13 years long. However, I did not go to school for sixth grade. So I actually only had a 12 year span. So in the chat, seeing some of the diverse responses here. Um, Oh, cool. I can post the questions right in the row. I'm not going to be typing those. I'll just display them on the uh, screen here. Um, okay, so please consider that uh, long-term experience as a user. Pardon me. Uh, long-term experience as a user does not prepare someone to be a designer. Uh, I have traversed many bridges thousands of times, but would not consider myself qualified to build a bridge. Um, we have all gone through some educational experience um, and we've kind of got a fish in a fishbowl view. Uh, if you've not had the chance to be a part to be a part of or explore the system that is the educational environment, I think I'll hopefully paint a broader picture of what's involved in that during this. Um, so I would caution you as you um, perhaps have responses and, and feelings tied up in those 12 foundational years of your life that you also consider the fish versus the fish bowl. As we step out of that, we get a different perspective of what we went through ourselves. Okay, hopefully that's enough of the disclaimers. We can jump in here. Uh, so a little bit of my background so you can understand some of my own perspective of what school meant for me. Um, 
I was in public high school through, I finished my New York State public high school in an upstate suburban uh, school district in 2000. Uh, I completed an undergraduate degree in computer science in 2004. Uh, and then I've been, I then got a master's degree in secondary education um, for two years and then began teaching at FD Roosevelt High School in Hyde Park. Um, you could do the math a little bit and say, well, gee, I jumped in on the dot-com bubble uh, to get into computer science. However, I actually started my computer science program in 2001, so I was jumping in while everyone was jumping out, um, for better or for worse. So I actually only did the computer science for three years to complete my bachelor's there. Uh, so I teach at F.D. Roosevelt High School right here in the Hudson Valley in Hyde Park. Um, we have the beautiful Vanderbilt Mansion and the Roosevelt Mansions right in my district. We are in perhaps the be most beautiful part of the Hudson Valley, or at least I would like to say so. Either way, I think we can all agree the Hudson Valley is an incredible place to live. Um, and I tell all my colleagues as I travel nationwide and interact with other high school teachers that, yes, I live in New York, but it is not New York City. I get to live just outside of it to where it's still beautiful. And if I have to, I can go down and, and take advantage of what the city offers. Um, so yes, I've been, I've taught all kinds of different things during my 16 years, um, from photography to guitar, <laughs> that was not my certification. Um, and I'm now fortunate enough to say that I teach computer science. Um, so who decides what is taught in public education? So now that I've painted a little bit of a disclaimer and, and a perspective of where I'm coming from on this, we can begin to dissect the question of who decides what is being taught. Um, and so I'm going to skip right into the answer on this one, well, or at least begin to answer that question. Uh, and the, the current predominant theory of educational control, um, who really gets to decide what is being taught, the current dominant theory is this idea of local control. And that is that the decisions of education of children in public schools are best made by those who are closest to the site, hence local governments. Um, and that's why we have school boards that kind of oversee our educational uh, facilities. Uh, New York State is a local control state, and that means that locally elected volunteer boards of education make the decisions for the local schools. Um, in practice, however, uh, local school boards are really just implementing the numerous regulations from both state and federal level above them. So even though we say it's locally controlled, yes, they get to make local decisions. However, it's state and federal regulations that are doing that, such as at the federal level, uh, Congress enacts the national regulations like NC, uh, No Child Left Behind and Every Student Succeeds Act. These are federal laws um, that predominantly address equal access and not what to, what to teach in the classrooms. So most federal laws don't dictate content in a classroom. They just ensure that all students have access and that it is equal. Um, now, federally, they will attempt to guide the direction and they'll do that through funding using the carrot and stick approach, you know, uh, race to the top, if you're familiar with that, that was about uh, four or five years ago that was going on and that was the federal government offering lots of money if states did these things for and in their schools. Uh, but predominantly the federal government isn't dictating what is taught in the classroom. They're just ensuring everyone has access. New York State, on the other hand, uh, has the legislature appoints a board of regents. The board of regents supervises New York's educational services and then they oversee data collection, school accountability, standards, uh, state exams, teacher licensure, and so on. Um, this is the organizational chart of the New York State Education Department. There are many facets involved in that. This is also where you see licensure. This is where museums are a part of, because this is all part of education in the state of New York. Uh, so it is not just the high school experience is not just the elementary, middle school, and high school experience. It's all facets of education that is governed by the state of New York. Um, so local decisions are all being dealt with from those regulations coming down. So in what ways do schools differ across New York? Um, in what ways 
do you see schools different across New York? It would be a question I would love to hear. Um, we think of like the movie City Slickers in which, you know, they highlighted the funny differences between city and rural life. Well, we're in New York. We have high schools, public high schools regulated by New York State Education Department, like Stuyvesant High School, which is a strong computer science specific high school. And yet we also have high schools, same governance, same regulations, like say Wyndham Ashland Jewett, which their high school is in the exact same building that the kindergartners are in. It's that small of a district. In fact, it's so small, they had to put three localities together, both Wyndham Ashland and Jewett to have enough school, enough students to form a school, right? So diversity across the state is extreme both in economics, density, community values, infrastructure, right? Just looking at the state of New York, uh, this is an, we live in a greatly varied state. And I tell friends and family that I live in one of the best places right here in New York, right here in the Hudson Valley. And we know that 90 minutes from here is a very different place. You go 90 minutes north and you're talking about the suburbs of Albany. You go 90 minutes south and you're talking the heart of Manhattan very very different and right here even in the hudson valley we have rural we have city all right new york education policy what they dictate applies to new york city schools as well as woodstock right? and that's where this policy may not be what we are hoping for but it has to work across so what's being taught in the schools as dictated by new york state is has to apply in all of those settings So I'd be curious, based on understanding that there is diversity across the state of New York and that New York does dictate some of what, and we'll take a look at what that means, uh, what was taught in your school? Perhaps you had a keyboarding class in your school, perhaps a sports management or fashion, or even driving was a part of your school. Who then decides that? How can you have some classes offering agricultural classes and other high schools not? Right, we're, we're pretty familiar with math, science, reading, writing, English, world languages, and gym, but what about the other subjects? How do you require those or not require those in some? How does that fit in? Well, um, in case you were wondering, perhaps the most succinct way of looking at this is at the end of those 12 years, what must a student have achieved? Well, we look at what are called the graduation requirements. You are officially a graduate of high school if you have earned four, high, four years of high school English, four years of high school social studies, three of science, three of math, uh, one of a language other than English. We might think of those as foreign language, but to be more inclusive, we call those languages other than English. It doesn't matter what those are. Uh, visual art, you need to have taken one year of visual arts. Uh, phys ed, you need to have done four half years, meaning every other day kind, and then a half year of, of health class. And then here's where that fits in this three and a half years of electives. You choose what those electives are. And every school, there's where that local control has a significant impact is what electives do the schools offer. So what's being taught in the classrooms? If those are the classes that have to be taught, those are the classes that perhaps the school chooses to teach, who decides what's taught in the classroom? Well, state ed, we're not done with state ed yet, New York State Education Department. New York State Education regulates the learning objectives of what's being taught. Um, to put that in developers' terms, the capabilities of an app are dictated by the by the customer, but it's but the implementation is not. So state ed dictates what the student is capable of when they graduate, when they complete a course. These are what are referred to as the standards, the standard objectives for a course. So, for example, I put on this on the screen here, New York State Education's standard for third grade math. This is one of the standards. And if we read it, it says solve problems involving the four operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and identify 
and extend patterns in arithmetic. So this is a standard that is dictated. So for instance, a sub point of that, solve two, solve two step word problems posed with whole numbers and having whole number answers using the four operations. So this is one of the learning standards that New York State requires students in third grade math be capable of. And this is one of about 30 standards for third grade math students. Now, of course, I'd be remiss if I were to talk about standards, if I didn't also mention standardized exams, such as the Regents exams. If you have kids in the public education system, we all know the, stand, the Regents exams are at the end of the year. This is intended to assess whether the students are meeting that. Again, in developers' terms, this is when the customer tests the prototype and says, does it meet the criteria? Right? This is standardized tests are intended to assess that. Um, yes, some teachers could teach to the test, and I would propose that if the test does fairly measure the standards, that should be fine. That's a whole other ball of wax dealing with how assessments can and cannot actually achieve that. Um, but the standards are what the tests are measuring. So again, that allows teachers some flexibility with how. So we'll advance on. If New York State only says, here are the 30 things that a student must learn in third grade math, and that's where state ed stops its regulations. Here's where the local districts come in and say, we get to now decide how that is learned. So we could think again in developers terms, this is where the program or the practitioner decide the toolkits that they're going to use to implement this app. Right? This is where the teacher gets to say, okay, I know what the students need to be capable of, how do I want to develop that? How do I want to engender that in them so that they are capable of meeting that objective? Um, so standards lead to what are referred to as curriculums. Uh, these are often, these are sometimes locally developed. Sometimes these are commercial products. There are companies that will take the learning standards and say, okay, for a 180 day year, 180 day school year, here's what you could do throughout those days. And here's how we could develop a curriculum plan for that. Uh, curriculums then group the knowledge and skills into complementary activities or projects. Those projects or units are then implemented as classroom uh, assignments or even homework plans, right? So we start with state's regulations, then give the flexibility either at the local or in the classroom level to then what does that actually look like in the classroom. Um, if you were to visit State Ed's website, you would see a, this is a screenshot right off of there. They have um, listed what are the state standards for every single one of these subject areas. From the arts to math, to phys ed, to science, English language, arts, health, technology, education, languages other than English. And there, the one that warms my heart the most is computer science and digital fluency. It brings me great joy because over the past four years, this has been a long process that I've been able, that I've been fortunate enough to contribute towards the development of New York State's learning objectives for computer science in K-12 schools. And so I wanted to spend uh, the rest of the emphasis of this class to actually share with you what is being taught about computer science in particular in our classrooms. What are those New York State required objectives regarding computer science? Now, I did, I did mention that this is over the last three or four years. This is brand new. If you had gone to the state's website a year ago, computer science and digital, digital fluency wasn't there. Um, the New York State Education Department has been in the process for the last four years of creating what are those objectives? What should be taught compu about computer science at, to K-12 students? So we're gonna dig into those a little bit of what those objectives actually are. So what are the computer science learning standards? This is not how is it taught, this is what are the objectives that we want K-12 students to be learning about. So David, before you start, I got a question, sure. right? Um, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, for computer science, you know, what grade, you know, do they start that in high school or do you start that in pre-K? 
um, almost pre-K. They, they chose to leave preschool out. So the computer science and digital fluency learning of standards as regulated by New York State will be starting at the kindergarten level. And there are learning objectives for kindergarten up through 12th grade as far as what they should be learning about computer science. So we're going to dig in and I'll show you some exact uh, examples of that. And that's what I wanted to spend the bulk okay. of our time remaining on. Uh, so just to give you an overview of them, because defining what computer science is, is still an open question, even in the computer science world. Uh, what, what is included in computer science? What isn't part of computer science? Uh, I will, I, I oftentimes refer to these as computer science learning standards, to be fair. These are computer science and digital fluency. So this is not just computer science. So you'll even see some in here about, you know, how do I operate, how do I keyboard, right? Keyboarding skills. I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't consider those a part of computer science, but it is a related skill that we do want to develop in students and will prepare them to be ready for learning some computer science. So you'll see some foundational skills mixed in here that allow us to then open the doors to bigger things. So overview of the 34 learning standards that New York has defined for each of the grade bands. So broken up into five concept areas. There's impacts of computing. There are about five objectives for each grade band that students should meet about impacts of computing, about computational thinking, about networks and system design, about cybersecurity and digital literacy. I think your question is very appropriate. And, and this one always, this one got me when it first came up. Wait, we're gonna teach cybersecurity to kindergartners? What does that even look like? I mean, are we teaching them pens testing? No, that's not even at the, at the high school level, right? But what does cybersecurity look like uh, for a middle school, what does the impacts of computing look like? What can we be teaching them? So we're going to dig in a little bit. Obviously, I can't cover everything, but I'm going to try my best to give you a quick overview of so you kind of know what is the computer science that's being taught in our classrooms. So within each of those concept areas, so I took those five, and each of those five are broken down into sub-concepts, and you can see those listed here. Right, so impacts of computing, there are two specific learning objectives that deal with impacts of computing on society. There are three that deal with impacts of computing and ethics. There are three, uh, there's one about accessibility and there's one about career pathways. In computational thinking, there are four sub-concept areas. Networks and system design, there are two. Cybersecurity has three and digital literacy has two. We'll look more detail at these. To note, each of these concept areas has approximately five objectives in each one. Now, some have more, some have less. Um, so five, sorry, seven. Why do I keep saying five? Seven. Each of these areas has five. So there are five concept areas. There are seven standards approximately in each of these. Uh, certainly computational thinking has a couple more than that because this is more dense. This is more of what we would traditionally think of as computer science, right? You can see algorithms and programming, abstraction, data analysis, modeling and simulation. Um, and, and then some of them have a little bit less than seven. So cybersecurity only has five, networks and system design only five. So what are we expecting of students in these areas? So if we look specifically at the impacts of computing, what does that mean? What, are, what does New York think students need to learn? Uh, so the impacts of computing explores the development of computing technologies as driven by human needs. There's been a major shift in the past decade toward this idea of, of responsible computing. And I think this idea of impacts of computing kind of captures part of that, right? The ethics that we need to be thinking about, it's not just, can I program a data analysis of these individuals, but should I? What data should I be capturing of the visitors to my website and which shouldn't I, right? The impacts of computing. What software should be out there? What are the legal implications, the ethical implications? What perspectives do we need to be considering? Right, and we have breadth involved in this, personal, social, cultural impacts, accessibility impacts, legal, economic, and ethical, right? Both on the local, national, and global level. So these are all kind of 
these are the topics that are being discussed in those objectives. Uh, we look at computational thinking. As I mentioned, this is the more traditional computer science kinds of topics. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, this phrase, computational thinking, uh, this was originally uh, put forward back in 1980 by Seymour Papert in, in the fantastic book called Mindstorms. He was one of the first folks in the 70s to start bringing computers into classrooms. And if you remember back what a computer looked like in the 70s, that was no simple task. And to say, hey, this really cool computer, we're going to take it and give it to, to elementary students. That was revolutionary at the time. No one else was thinking of that. They were looking for use. They were looking for businesses that could capitalize on that time. Seymour Papert said, I think there's an educational benefit to these computers being in there. So he wrote Mindstorms and talked about this idea of computational thinking. It's not just can you program, but how do you think about how you compute something? Um, so computational thinking extends beyond the general use of computers or technology in education. So this is not just do we have projectors in classrooms? What's a smart board and is that useful? It's beyond that. It's what can you create? What is the skills that you can use to create with that technology? Uh, networks and system design. Um, we're going to see some fundamental networking concepts introduced here, but this is not meant to prepare students to be IT specialists. It's meant to introduce some of the concepts that, well, you kind of need in society. What's an access point? If I want to have internet in my home, I kind of need to know some basics of networks. I should be approaching, I should be approaching problems with them system design, right? And that's what these concepts wrap up in here. Um, cybersecurity is what it sounds like. Uh, this gets broken down into the idea of risks, safeguards, and responses, potential attacks, right? Um, digital literacy, this is a multifaceted concept area. And this is, as I mentioned, you know, the, the most typical example of this is the keyboarding skill. That's part of our digital literacy. Um, how do I access a website, right? That's not necessarily a computer science skill but that is a digital fluency skill that we do need to be developing within our students. And here, New York State has broken that down and said, these are the skills that they need to have. Okay, so you may be thinking, all right, those sound good, but who got to decide what was included and what wasn't included? Because I'm about to show you what the 35, 34 things were in each grade band and you may be upset that certain things were or were not included in there. This was a large conglomerate of uh, started back in 2018 when there was an open call for authoring committee members. This went out to industry, went to education, went to parents, went to community members. Uh, they were drafted. There were over 800 responses to the original draft of what should and should not be included. This had broad lots of eyes viewing this and giving tons of feedback. Um, the New York State Education Department, the Board of Regents sent back for revisions. And then in December, 2020, they received approval. Over 120 individuals from across New York, and it was across, we had North Country, Southern Tier, Western New York, New York City, Long Island, Capital District, and Mohawk Valley were all represented in this 120 individuals all across New York State. You can even see their names if you'd be curious who specifically uh, was involved in this. It was a lot of different folks. So you may have an opinion and we all brought opinions to the table on this. Um, and it was the general consensus that came out of that. So I think a very appropriate question is who's going to take this class? And this is kind of a trick question because the answer to that is it's not a class. New York State doesn't say this has to be a class. New York State only said these 30, 34 learning objectives, these standards must be met by a student in this, these grades. All students are expected to learn the 34 computer science and digital fluency learning standards. It's not an option. In fact, right in the opening document, uh, right in the opening section of the document that lays out what all these standards are, 
it says every student will know how to live productively and safely in a technology dominated world. This includes understanding the fundamental features of digital technologies, why and how they work, and how to communicate and create using those technologies. Every student. So as you have an opportunity to look at these, and I'll show share with you some of the specifics of these, this is what every student is expected to meet. So to view the standards, um, I will put the link here in the chat. Oops, let me go back here. So those of you who are viewing from home, uh, you'll be able to take a look at these. If you're not able to, you can just go to the New York State, I said, New York State Education Department. You can go to that curriculum instruction area and go to the computer science and digital fluency, which brings you right into here where you can see the computer science digital fluency learning standards. There are those five concepts and there is the document um, I'm sharing with everyone. Uh, the link in the chat, this is not mine, this is on the state ed website. So taking a look at this document, pull this up here. Please pardon this opening graphic, this one always kills me. Uh, those in with a techno technological background who have been involved in this long enough will look at that picture and say, okay, that's nice, but why do they still have CRT monitors pictured on an opening document for 2021? Uh, most folks don't recognize that that is still a CRT monitor because, well, the glass reflection <laughs> exists on CRT monitors, you can see from the bulb. Anyways, so, Please disregard that, not many people recognize it. So this is the document, it houses all of those learning standards. Like I gave you a snapshot of the math one, there is a math, a science, all of these exist. Uh, this is the New York State Computer Science and Digital Fluency Standards. So we'll jump down to where we can see some of the pages. So here we go. This is the impacts of computing category or concept area. This is the subcategory about society and then here we see what the standards are for, for K1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, and 9, 12. So these are taught in grade bands. This New York State Ed said there's some flexibility in how and when you're teaching these, but by the end of first grade, so during kindergarten and first grade, a student should be able to accomplish this objective, identify and discuss how tasks are accomplished with and without computing technology. Right, so these are broken down into grade bands, and you can see there is a progression towards the 912 evaluate the impact of computing technologies on equity, access, and influence in a global society. So, in my classroom, for instance, I might ask students here is a, a computing technology, please analyze it for what equity impact might be had by this technology, what access might be limited or gained from this technology, what influence it might have in a global society, right? And for them to then speak intelligently about that. So that's one of the standards and you'll see the 912. Here's a second one here. And each one of these is numbered. So you see it's a grade band. You'll see the category, the concept area that it's in and then the number. And so you'll see that there are seven of these and the impacts of computing. And then it switches to the next concept area of computational thinking. And then it switches in to networks and system design, cybersecurity, and then digital literacy. So within the standards, you'll see that there's that code that I just showed you where it mentions the grade band, the concept area, the actual standard number. So if you're flipping through that, you're curious what's being taught at each of the grades, just so you can kind of get a reference for that. The standard, the objective, the thing that the teachers need to prepare students for are right here in the visualize a simple data set right in that box. And they're numbered because teachers like myself will say, okay, I know I've got these 34 I have to cover, Right, and check them off. I mean, in fact, I reference them in the actual activities. This activity addresses learning standard 9-12CT.8. And so that I know these are what the objectives are that I'm attempting to prepare students for. 
So within there, as we showed you, uh, they are presented in a grid. There are some nicer organizations of the learning standards right on the state ed website. So if you wanted to look at a specific grade band, um, then you don't have all of the content. There's a lot in each one of those pages. It's about a 60 page document. Uh, you can We can narrow that down if you look at a specific grade band. Uh, what you might find more helpful is to actually start at the 912 grade band and say, okay, this is what New York State Ed, this is what the 120 authors and group consensus thought was a valuable skill or knowledge for the student to have. How does that develop progressively all the way down from a kindergarten to work its way up? And so you should see a progression through the years kind of introducing the fundamentals in the K1, 2, 3 grade bands to work towards the 912 skill level. So a question that certainly weighs on myself as being a classroom teacher is how will these be taught? And this is an interesting thing I should mention because New York State had intentionally designed the K1 and 2, 3, so the early primary grades, to be taught in such a way that they can be taught without a single computing device. So these are what are referred to as unplugged learning activities, meaning we could teach the concept of loops by having students actually enact a repeating process. We can introduce computing concepts without necessarily having to put them in front of a computer screen. The reality is not all of New York State schools have the same funding, have the same resources to do what every school in New York State would love to do. So those early school grades are specifically designed so that the concepts could be taught without a computing device, considered unplugged activities. Now, this isn't a New York State idea. This actually started back in 1998. A uh, computer scientist, edu computer science educator uh, out in New Zealand named Tim Bell. He's put out a number of great academic research articles about teaching computer science unplugged, CS unplugged. And actually go to uh, his website, which is really fascinating, csunplugged.org. And they have entire lesson plans for many different grade levels, all about teaching computer science without a computer. Is that the ideal? I wouldn't say that it is, but the reality is these learning objectives need to be achievable in all of New York's diverse schools and for all of New York's diverse learners. So those K, one, two, three, and even some of the three, five grade grades are unplugged, unpluggable activities. The other important thing is that these will not only be taught unplugged, these will be taught integrated into existing. Uh, what was the website for CS Unplugged? Sorry about that, let me get that. So New York State, when they were creating these, did not want to obligate schools to have a computer science class just to teach computer science to the students. The goal, was actually to allow these to be taught as interdisciplinary concepts. So in a math class, let's teach them how sequence matters. And let's actually do some coding in math class to where they're checking off some of these computer science learning standards. Then when they go into a science class, they'll check off some others and accomplish those. So these are not necessarily designed to be taught as separate computer science classes. So don't expect the schools around you to all of a sudden start offering computer science to every student as a class. They should be teaching the computer science standards either as a class that all students take or have found ways to integrate these into all of existing classes. I'm currently working with the art teacher here in my building who actually teaches a fashion class um, to do some coding that will do embroidery on those automated embroidery machines, right? So there are ways to integrate computer science into existing courses. And so this won't necessarily be standalone learning objectives. 
why teach this? Well, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. I think you all acknowledge the value of teaching computer science because many of you are in a field or related discipline to where knowing computer science, having had the chance to learn some of those fundamental concepts all through your K-12 years may have set you up even better into where you've gotten to. I view it as this chance to say, okay, you can't be what you can't see. My students rarely come into my room saying, I want to be a computer scientist because they don't know what a computer scientist is. But now having experienced the computer science and digital fluency standards, and we've told them, hey, this is what an algorithm is. How? Wow, that's really interesting. I'd like to know more. I'd like to be a person who works with algorithms. That becomes something that they can be, right? If we haven't even introduced them to it, we shouldn't be surprised that they're not signing up to be it. The other reason I think this is extremely critical is that colleges have a computer science capacity crisis right now. They're crying out that too many kids are signing up for computer science. And unfortunately, that's a good thing, but also a bad thing. Because what that means is now they're starting to filter out who gets to take it. And the reality is prior knowledge is what they're using as the differentiator. Yes, kids say they want to go into computer science because that's where the money is, right? Elon Musk, Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, I want the money like they have. So they're going into computer science for the effects of, they're not necessarily going in because they want to do it. Right. And so we give them the prior knowledge to say, hey, is this really where you want to go? Is this your thing? And even better, here's your thing applied in a science setting. So you don't have to be a computer scientist. You can learn computer science in science. You can learn computer science in literature. How cool would it be to analyze Shakespeare's canon and start analyzing the word usage in there? Write some simple code. What word gets used the most? Okay, that's easy. But what word always precedes love? We can do rich, deep, interesting analyses when they have a little bit of coding knowledge. So prior knowledge is a differentiator at the college level as to who gets to learn computer science. But computer science opens up new doors for innovation when you bring it into other subject areas. So how will industry, industry or society be impacted by all students learning these standards? If all New York State K-12 students are indeed being taught and learning these, what's that going to change to our society? How's that going to change your customers? I don't have an answer for that. But I do want you all to be aware that this is beginning now. In fact, I should mention, if I jump ahead a little bit here, um, how will this impact schools? Well, the actual adoption of this doesn't begin, the year one implementation of these learning standards doesn't begin until September 2023. We've got some capacity building, right? For our schools to be able to implement these learning standards, we've got to develop the educators and the programs and the capabilities to do that. So we are currently in an adoption and capacity building time. Uh, so don't expect the high school graduates to, hey, hey, I can check off. I know exactly what the classic algorithms are and I can implement them. I right? don't expect that right out of high school yet. But uh, we will start to see the effects of that beginning in 2023. We'll start seeing our schools engaging in these more and more. And hopefully that means our society, our um, industries will now be able to adjust based on that. Um, what I want to mention to you all as I wrap up here is looking for your support in this because I had the, the fortune of choosing to study in a formal setting computer science so that now as I come into a high school as an educator, I have that background knowledge. But most of the folks that I've been out there across the country training don't have that. 
I'm working with gym teachers, English teachers, art teachers who've never done any computer science or coding and that are being asked by their school to start including and in, in, in offering that. This is not a small ask. And so your support is greatly appreciated. Your understanding, your empathy is greatly appreciated. And your support of the educators who are including this is greatly desired because you are the folks, and I should say, it's the computer science industry that got New York State Ed to actually acknowledge computer science should be taught and introduced to all students. New York State Education Department has not added a new subject area since back in the 70s, I believe it was. And it wasn't until industry came in and convinced lawmakers to mandate New York State Education Department to actually engage with and consider what should be taught. So four asks for you. One is to learn more for yourself. One is to connect with teachers. One is to consider volunteering. And one is to continue to create opportunities for empowerment for students. First, my ask is that you learn more about this. Um, CSEdWeek.org, December 6th through 12th is Computer Science Education Week, K-12 Computer Science Education Week. Uh, this is a time where you'll see a media blitz pushing what is computer science, where is it being taught in K-12. Great opportunities. You should be seeing um, libraries, community centers, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, troops, hopefully engaging with computer science during that December 6th through 12th. By the way, that's Grace Hopper's birthday, which is why that mm -hmm. first week in December is always chosen. Uh, I would encourage you to connect right here in the Mid-Hudson Valley. There is a Computer Science Teachers Association, those who are teaching computer science in the public schools. Uh, they get together monthly um, to, to learn and expand their own knowledge and to support their colleagues. Uh, I encourage you to volunteer. Uh, code.org has a spot where you can say, hey, this matters. I'd be willing to volunteer to spend a couple hours in a school talking about why computer science matters. Uh, or if you're really dedicated, Microsoft has an organization called Teals, a nonprofit organization, which specifically supports schools offering more education. They come in and say, hey, we're Microsoft. We can help you with this, but they need boots on the ground, which is where industry knowledge, industry experts can come in and help. Uh, I encourage you to keep creating opportunities and empowerment. Open Hub's Hackathon is an amazing opportunity for kids to see the value of learning the computer science that's going to be start being taught. These hackathon events are where the kids get to interact and see the power of creativity and bring that stuff to life. So I encourage you all to support things like this. This doesn't happen just because a couple high school teachers get together and say, let's bring our students. This happens because of organizations like open hub which bring in the industry and let them just be around <coughs> students and show them what they're doing well i can see yuli is back on the camera so i need to wrap up thank you um for hearing me out thank you for exploring what's being taught in schools um again please i'd love for you to connect uh that's my email address if there's at all any interest in or looking for opportunities to get involved, please email me. I'd be glad to help connect you with some of these uh, and share out any resources that I have. So thank you very much, uh, Dave. I think there's a question uh, you know, for you here, right? Uh, let me sure. read it to you. Standards uh, leads uh, to curriculum. Does it mean uh, the experience mm. varies much from school to school? And uh, you know, uh, uh, curious to see digital currency standard implemented. And also, what kind of uh, support do you expect from the industry? Sure, those are great questions. Volunteering only, or something else? Yeah, so uh, I, I'd be glad to answer that. Let me start with the easiest one. Here is: Does it mean that the experience varies from school to school? I think the pandemic is a good example of that. We all saw the variety of how schools handled or responded to the pandemic. Right, that's an example of local control, right? There were certain regulations and some schools were able to implement it this way, other schools did that. They all did things differently. For better, for worse, there is local control. So yes, every kid's experience in a high school is different. The end goals remain the same. Um, 
yes, I'm very curious to see the standards implemented. I am excited. I've spent the last, like I said, three or four years working to get these in place mm-hmm. and to now start rolling those out. Uh, what kind of ex- support do you expect from industry? Um, Teals is a great example. There are some industry experts who actually volunteer for, for to help coach a teacher who is teaching computer science for the first time. And they're there to kind of like say, hey, I can help you fix the bugs. I can help you understand how this fits into the big picture, right? There are also some industry experts who run after school clubs in schools. There are some industry experts who volunteer and come to the Computer Science Teachers Association and just share their knowledge and and teach what they're doing in business. So I can excite my students by saying, hey, right here in the Hudson Valley, there's a company doing this right so lots of opportunities we just need the volunteers and whatever level that's at for you yep the other question that i have you know is that uh, you know are they going to measure uh the quality and uh the performance of search uh, transformation yeah uh, certainly assessment is a hugely complicated thing um it, because as we talk about, well, every kid's got a different experience. How do we assess that? And that's a that's a nasty open challenge. I would I would say that's worth continuing to explore. But right now, our biggest challenge is getting this implemented. Okay. Let's get this out there. Let's get the teachers prepared and and doing this. Then let's worry about the quality of it. Right? It doesn't matter if one school is doing an amazing job and nobody else gets anything. Right. We don't right now we don't want to constrict on quality. Yep. I got we another want... question for you before before you do. Are there yep. uh what are the qualifications, right? Uh requirement to teach or volunteer uh computer science uh in uh schools throughout New York yeah. State. Yeah, New York State um has a teacher shortage. <laughs> we are very short on teachers. General teacher <laughs> shortage or a computer science teacher shortage? Um definitely the first general teacher shortage and extremely the second in math too right yeah most of the stem fields are are very they're out of teachers <laughs> and the problem is they keep retiring uh, so, so. so but the the problem is that if you're not a certified teacher in new york state mm-hmm. they're not going to let you come in and teach unless it's a volunteer basis so Right. So there are programs in place to allow folks with industry experience to work towards and get certified to be a teacher. Um, In particular, the New York State Computer Science Teaching Certification actually says industry experience is is one option for gaining, for demonstrating your ability to know the subject so you can teach it. Now, that doesn't mean that you're excused from learning how to teach and what does pedagogy mean? What's assessment? How does that work in a classroom, right? So certainly still learning to be a teacher is there, but industry experience can actually skip you over any of the educational requirements regarding that subject area. I think education (laughs) certification is still required as far as I learned. Yes. Uh, but Teal's organization works around that by saying, hey, let's pair you up with a classroom teacher. And so then you're not actually the, required to meet those because there is a professional teacher in the classroom who may not know computer science, but they know the educational side. And so by pairing you up with that teacher, you, you can begin teaching computer science. Yeah, it might address volunteering um, option, but it would not address the teacher shortage because there are so many industry professionals who have amazing skills teaching in colleges. They are not allowed as far as I know to teach in schools, public schools. Uh, Correct, not without getting a teaching certification or at least being in the process of getting a a teaching certification per New York's regulations. That is correct, yeah. (laughs) I'm not arguing for or against, just stating the reality that we have, yeah. Yep. I just have to mention that um, <laughs> John there. Sturman, who is actually our facilitator here, um, and thank you, Mark, for facilitating this session too. Uh, John has is teaching in RPI, and I don't oh. think he is entitled to teach or eligible to teach in the public school. No, I have no certification, uh, mm-hmm. but I'm teaching successfully on a, on a, uh, 
You uh, see the gap post, right post here. Secondary. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, I've been teaching successfully for 20 years. Um, but, you know, they won't let me into a high school. At least not a, not a New York State high school. Sure. And, and, and I mean, similarly, RPI wouldn't let me in to start teaching because I wouldn't meet their requirements to, to be a, uh, a lecturer or a, a professor. Um, because there's this is similarly processes would be a little bit different. And it, it is, but teach. there are each each setting has its own kind of nuances. And so there are expectations of of the individuals going into there. I wouldn't say that they are the same. Um, the, right. the students at a college level are not the same as students at a high school level. And, and so the expectations of the folks who can do that are different. Now, I, I had a conversation with the technology teacher in the local district here, sure, um, sure. you know, saying, hey, how come you're not doing more computer science? He says, well, you know, I don't know anything about it. I mean, he's not doing any kind of language, not, you know, not Scratch, not, uh, you know, beginning Python or any kind of language teaching, which would, you know, bring the, our local students up to speed more. Um, as far as I know, I don't know any, in the last 15 years, I don't know anyone who's graduated from the local high school here who's gone on to RPI, for example. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's just an interesting thing that, you know, sure. here's the person who would be doing that, who would be paving that way, is not equipped. And that's an issue. I would say, based on my experience, and I heard David actually address this on the <laughs> Computer Science Teacher Association specifically, it's way easier to get the teacher to learn or to certify with computer science than the other way around. It's really very territorial. For some reason, I don't know how to <laughs> explain it, but that's the experience so far. And actually being too much protective for our high school, for our school kids, we are limiting their opportunities and just pushing them to after school programs and that kind of hobby stuff, hobby, hobby style. But this is the most fruitful time for them to get excited about computer science. So definitely industry and pedagogy, high school has to be cross-pollinated more, but barriers are definitely there. Sure, so I don't disagree you. with you. I think well, it was a wonderful presentation. We wonderful. learned a lot. Yeah, thank David, you. thank you so much for, you know, for bringing, me. bringing your experience and your expertise um, and you know, all the work that you've done for the, the, the standards, it's, you know, really valuable. It's amazing, actually. He is the game changer right here. It's, it's it's a neat process to have gone through. I have learned a ton through that, and it's been a blast to to interact with folks like you to say, "Hey, good stuff's coming. We're working on." It. It's great. All right, great. Let's. Uh, it's time to shift gears. We're going to. Um, we're moving more into. Uh, you know, we're setting up for the hackathon, and um, you know, this next talk by Tyler King uh, is about design thinking. Uh, Tyler is the design leader.